Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening to all participants. And I'm very pleased to see you all of you joining us virtually from different parts of the world. I would like to start by commending the UN Global Compact and the Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the United Nations for hosting this OECD Business Forum. It is an excellent opportunity for government, the private sector, and international organizations to network share information and identify effective action. To achieve the SDGs as outlined in Agenda 2030, we require actors in the public and private sectors to work together at scale. This challenge is fundamentally related to effective governance and demands the reorientation of how public and private actors interact with each other. We need to rethink the way we work together and to anticipate scenario of COVID. Ambition to find sustainable solutions will be critical. There is a, an increasing recognition of the importance to preserve the role of small and medium enterprises in supporting overall economic growth. SMEs play a critical role in all economies, particularly in developing countries. SMEs account for the majority of businesses worldwide and are crucial contributors to job creation and global economic development. According to the World Bank, they represent about 90% of businesses and more than 50% of employment worldwide. Formal SMEs contribute up to 40% of income in emerging economies. These numbers are significantly higher when informal SMEs are included. Six million jobs will be needed by 2030 to absorb the growing global workforce, which makes SMEs development a high priority for many governments around the world. In emerging markets, most formal jobs are generated by SMEs, which create seven out of ten. However, SMEs are struggling to survive and grow in too many countries. On one side, difficult, not impossible, business environments, rigid regulations, weak institutions, corruption, informality, lack of certainty, among other factors. Lack of digital skills, limited access to credit and markets. As the largest private sector network in the world, encompassing more than 50 million companies in 147 countries, the IOE is and has been committed for the past 100 years to creating, improving, and promoting enabling environment for sustainable enterprises, including micro, small, medium enterprises around the world. It is within this context that the IOE is undertaking efforts to bring together various stakeholders from the business world, key policymakers, and experts at the international level. The sharing of best practices, policy guidance, and recommendations will help to enable a conducive business environment. I strongly believe that when governments, multilateral organizations in the private sector work together, they can have a major impact on diversifying economies and promoting inclusive growth. To conclude, I cannot emphasize enough the concern of the international business community on the impact of the recent COVID-19 pandemic on jobs and business operations. This is confirmed by the alarming data coming from the International Labour Organization, World Bank, and OECD, indicating the slowdown of economic activity and massive job losses in 2020-2021. It will take another decade for economic recovery unless policymakers make a concerted, collected effort to mitigate the damages made to and production.
We will focus our discussions today on how education, skills development and training, access to finance and technology can help policymakers lay the right foundations for strong, sustained, and socially inclusive SMEs worldwide, and SMEs that will better contribute to achieving the Agenda 2030. Thank you all for being with us. Back to you, Matthias. Thank you so much, Errol. And first of all, can I ask everyone to mute? Luis, can I ask you to mute yourself, please? Luis Camara, thank you for joining. Yes. Please mute yourself. Otherwise, we have problems here with the, loud, with the, with the noise. Thank you. Now, please mute yourself. We are, we are not there with you. Please mute yourself. Everyone else, if you don't speak, please mute yourself. Otherwise, we will have your problems. So with that, I'm sorry for the technical problems we had here at the beginning. But anyhow, we're looking forward to an extremely interesting conference. Errol, you gave us a very good context, so thank you so much for that. I directly go to Chantal, Chantal Line Carpentier, who is the chief of the New York office of UNCAT. She will give us an update and an insight why SMA actually should report on SDG which is of course not safe evident because SMEs have so much to, re to do. There is so much worry at the moment about the corona crisis, about the impact of um, loss of sales. So why, Chantal, would you think they have to report on the SDGs? And again, everyone else who is not speaking, please mute yourself. Over to you, Chantal. Thank you so much, Pantias, and thank you for asking to mute because it's it's very annoying and I really didn't hear everything that Errol was saying. So thank you for that. I appreciate. So thank you so much. Um, this is this is such an opportune uh, time to discuss this. And first of all, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. Um, the answer to the question for me is simple because we need data about entrepreneurs and MSMEs so we can help them help us recover better. While ignoring the 2008 financial crisis, entrepreneurs and MSMEs, and from now on I'll call them the EMSMEs, bear with me, are front and centers in countries and the UN response to COVID-19. Indeed, since the financial crisis, we have adopted, the, as was mentioned by Errol, the 2030 Agenda recognizing the role of MSMEs in SDG 4 and 8, the International Day of MSMEs on 27 June, and add several resolution and secretary general report on the role of entrepreneurship in achieving sustainable development in the SDGs. The UN secretary general, among others, have been vocal in repeating that the achieving the SDGs in a green, resilient, inclusive, circular and connected recovery is not possible without EMSMEs. As they are the bedrock of our communities, representing between 50 and 90 percent of employment and self-employment, including for vulnerable groups such as women, old people and youth, and generate, depending on countries, between 40 and 60 percent of GDPs. But I'll let my colleague from ITC go in further detail on statistics. The lack of data has delayed this widespread recognition of the key role of EMSMEs and is now impairing our ability to reach them and offer them the necessary support to survive first and then to drive the recovery by creating decent jobs. We can collect this data by simplifying and facilitating e-registration and by helping EMSMEs report against their SDG and COVID-19 contribution exactly in line with ongoing UN initiatives in which UNCTAD is collaborating. Now, before turning to how we do that, let me make sure we all agree that MSMEs are essential to a resilient, inclusive, strong recovery and to achieve the SDGs. And this is due to the innovation, innovative and appropriate Sorry, the innovative and opportunity seeking nature of entrepreneurs, the flexibility and adaptability of smaller scale businesses to new environment, and ability to provide innovative solutions for emerging new challenges in economic, social, and environmental areas. EMSMEs can be agent of change to achieving all SDGs, not just job creation and economic growth, like we used to say. EMSMEs are proving this in their, these abilities in the response to COVID-19. Let me just give you three examples taken from our UNCTAD eFounders Entrepreneurship Initiative. In Nigeria, Nigerian eFounders partner with each other in delivering daily food and product for locals, joining forces to create an online and offline supermarket. 
digital education platform like Ishuli and Ogenius Penda help Rwandan students continue to perceive education online. And Zagana.com delivers fresh produce from farm to every Filipino household, pivoting from focusing on bulk orders uh, before the pandemics. The central role of SMEs has been only been heightened by the pandemic, which has affected, however, MSMEs more harshly, uh, with estimate from ILO that two-thirds of the job of the 500 million full-time job equivalent loss coming from uh, the MSME sectors, and mostly due to the lockdown and lack of access to finance and customers. The pandemic exposed and deepened existing fragilities of our economic system, including of SMEs, of the way we treat MSMEs. This economic crisis has led MSMEs to, to MSMEs closure, cash flow pressure, erosion of working capital, interrupting supply chain, loss of production, income, and customers. MSME represent the majority of firm, as Errol mentioned, in sectors hit hardest, however, by the containment measures, such as non-essential services, comprising more than 230 million enterprises in wholesale and resale trade, retail trade. They have few resources and lower capacity to cope with the abrupt economic shocks without diversified businesses, markets, and external sources to leverage as this crisis lasts. And sadly, MSMEs were already behind on digitalizing their operation, including online sales that is being accelerated with the pandemic. And many others are in the informal economy without access to support packages at all. However, this is where the optimist in me always comes out. This, of course, this crisis can be an opportunity and is an opportunity. The good news is, unlike the response to the financial crisis, we are putting EMSMEs at the center of this crisis. Protecting jobs, supporting SMEs, and informal sector workers is one of the five pillars of the UN socioeconomic response to COVID-19. It underscored the need for a coherent and holistic policy response to build a resilient MSME sector and provide an unprecedented opportunity to emerge from this crisis with a business set of policies and measures for MSME promotion that existed prior to the pandemic. The socioeconomic response call on policymakers and government to focus on MSMEs and designing fiscal and monetary policies, providing them with health and employment insurance, scale up social protection and support to business to prevent liquidity issue to turn into bankruptcies and ensuing job losses. And to address the lack of fiscal space in most developing countries, the UN Secretary General has launched the COVID-19 Response and Recovery Fund to help the UN developing countries government to and the developing countries government to roll out a rapid socioeconomic recovery. This fund explicitly acknowledged that MSME contribute enormously to the 2030 agenda and the SDGs and call on the UN system to help improve MSME resilience through its transformative and sustainable recovery. The UN has already supported the development of 120 national socioeconomic recovery plans in developing countries that ensure coherence amongst these five pillars, as well as alignment with the SDGs and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And here's where the magic happens. MSMEs are uniquely placed to participate and contribute to the under-addressed SDGs in developing countries, such as healthcare, education, public mass transportation, women's security, and public distribution. If we were to provide them with frugal innovation mindset that can help them build upon and repurpose existing technologies and innovation and digital tools, aiming to provide low cost, high quality, inclusive solution to reach at last those left behind, it would create business opportunities. And let's face it, if it's not affordable, it is not sustainable. MSMEs also have the potential to foster environmental improvement. Through eco-innovation, for example, they can lead new green industries, especially in local and emerging market contexts that are unappealing or unfeasible often for large corporations. Indeed, MSMEs are used to be resource constrained, so they are best fit to deploy frugal innovation that do better with less to support circular processes that cuts out waste and pollution and product that cannot be recycled or reused um, at the end of their life cycle. MSMEs, we've said it and we need to repeat it, also create job and self-employment to the most vulnerable in our community. All this to say that we can thus achieve a win-win by strengthening MSMEs support and empower them to be the core responder to COVID-19, an agent to achieve the SDGs. 
For that, we also must make them aware of the 12 trillion business opportunity dollars, sorry, business opportunities associated with the SDGs and provide a coherent and comprehensive technical knowledge and skills, capacity, capital and incentive to incorporate sustainable practices in their business operation, technological upgrading program for the adoption of green and inclusive technologies, which in turn will increase market access and facilitate the adoption of technologies and digitalization. We, in, we can increase the inclusiveness impact by targeting women-owned, minor, minority, migrant, and youth-owned businesses to ensure a green, resilient, inclusive, and connected recovery. Now that is what we have established the central, not, sorry, now that we have established the central role of the MSMEs in recovering uh, response to COVID-19, we will need to have the data to target them, and I go back to the questions uh, that was originally asked, uh, to target them, but also on the impact of these measures to justify continued support, and this is where reporting comes in. There are two main constraints to having the required data. Lack of MSME registration, which is a vast proportion of, my, of entrepreneur working in the informal sector, and the cost and burden of reporting scheme for MSMEs. And UNCTAD is scaling up and expanding our e-registration and reporting work as part of a project entitled Global Initiative Towards Post-COVID-19 Resurgent of the MSME Sector, along with the five UN Regional Commission, DESA, among others. We have all partners to offer coherent entrepreneurship policy and ecosystems, business model, technology upgrading support, online tools and capacity building, guidelines to foster green, resilient, inclusive, and reconnected connected recovery, including based on rational and circular use of resources. And UNCTAD will expand its business facilitation program designed and implemented to and, and implement innovative e-government solution to support the MSMEs and provide private sector development. So through this e-registration, um, we will help MSMEs keep their personal data administration documents safely online, register with all mandatory registry, business registry, taxes, social security, apply for credit insurance and technical assistance, and report on their need for assistance from the government in the context of COVID-19. And of course, this gives an incentive for MSME to register and get access to the support. On to reporting. We will be helping also um, MSMEs in their reporting. As UNCTAD and UNEP are co-custodian of SDG 12.6 that encourage companies to adopt sustainable practices and sustainability reporting. Enterprise reporting play a key role in providing data on the private sector contribution to the SDG achievement. In the COVID-19 era, this role is becoming even more important as need of assessing companies' performance in environmental, social, and government issues for making decisions on providing financial and other support to companies and facilitate their green, resilient, inclusive, and connected resurgence. Reporting is also an important instrument for MSME to improve their access to investment and markets. Thankfully, we don't have to start from zero. UNCTAD will scale and fasten its ongoing work as Secretariat of the Intergovernmental Working Group on Expert on International Standard, ISAR, that developed and tested 33 core indicators for reporting contribution on the SDGs. The core indicators focus on measurable outcome related to climate change, environmental protection, social issues, um, uh, employee training, health and safety, gender balance, and good governance, among others. And these were tested in eight countries, including Colombia, Denmark, Guatemala, Kenya, Russian Federation, Egypt, Ukraine, and in Tanzania, specifically for MSME reporting. The core indicators guidance were piloted in different sectors, such as telecommunication, oil and gas, mining, healthcare, manufacturing, retail, hospitality, and energy sector. And this with the aim to validate the suggested approach and the availability of accounting data and improve the quality, comparability, and usefulness of this reporting by company, particularly MSMEs, which often lack the capacity, as we all know, to provide even basic information required by investors. Thank you, Chantal. That was really great. Super. That was an important insight. And we have a direct question to you, which comes from Stefan, who asked, how do we incentivize uh, SMEs to engage in the SNG SDG agenda? You already gave partly the answer to it by saying, you know, raising awareness and showing business opportunities, which the SNG SDG agenda brings with it. Any other reply you might have to this question? 30 seconds. 
Yes. Um, so basically, first of all, we need to raise the, to raise the awareness. SDG and MSMEs are so busy running their operation that, and especially in COVID-19 era, that they don't have time to go out and seek uh, these these new opportunities, especially now. So we need to raise this opportunity with them. We need to share good practices and um, with them and amongst themselves and network them. And this is something we're going to do. Each regional commission is going to create a platform at the regional level to provide all of the resources that MSMEs in their region have access to and be able to contact the agencies and other partners that can actually support them with that. Uh, and I, we believe that by having the data to be able to support, um, remember, they, these are very recent, the data to support how much employment they create, how much uh, they, could, they could contribute to their communities um, is very recent. So by having this data and showing them the importance and simplifying the processes of registration and of data reporting, we can help them help us recover better. And we can't waste another crisis. We have to support the MSMEs this time. Thank you so much. That is really fascinating. And indeed, one problem SMEs have is to access the global market, right? That is one of the big barriers they're facing. And we have two specialists who can help us what the international trading system is doing to support SMEs to access the global market. With us is Barbara Ramos, the Chief of Research of the International Trade Center, and Alvaro Ramirez, who is a Senior Specialist on Sustainable Enterprises from the ILO. So we start with you, Barbara, for five minutes. What is actually the ICT doing to support SMEs to join the global market? Over to you. Well, thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the, the International Organization of Employers for the opportunity to be part in this very timely discussion, as, as Chantal mentioned. Um, as you said, I'm here today representing the International Trade Center, which is a joint UN WTO organization fully focused on increasing the competitiveness of SMEs, particularly in developing and least developed countries. How do we do that? We follow a framework that was developed at ITC that we call Connect, Compete, Change. So essentially we support SMEs to increase their ability to connect to markets, to compete in those markets, and to change, take advantage of, of emerging uh, uh, situations to change and continuously uh, be competitive. And we do that at three levels, at the SME level itself, at the level of uh, trade and investment support institutions, and at the business level, so the policy level. So we have what we call a matrix of connect, compete, change, working towards those three pillars at three different levels. So as you can see, the question that was posed to me as a speaker today was, what does the multilateral system do, and what can you do better to encourage more widespread and inclusive SME participation in global markets? And that question is at the very core of the mission of the International Trade Center. Now, I would like to address that question at two levels. I think the first one, we need to discuss the need to strengthen the multilateral system itself. The world we live in today and the challenges that it faces are so complex, so interrelated, that no government alone will be able to solve them. Cohesion, collaboration are essential if we are to tackle these challenges, not just COVID, but all the challenges that we are bound to face in the years to come. But instead of collaboration, what we are observing is the international community turning towards unilateralism and protectionism. As many seem to have lost their, their trust in the system, let's put it that way. So reforming some multilateral institutions such as the WTO is certainly part of the solution because the lack of these multilateral institutions uh, will most certainly lead to policies that will hurt, hurt the poorest of the poor, most vulnerable, be them countries, companies, or people. So first and foremost, we need to ensure that the system works. And then we need to ensure that the system works for all. COVID, the trade tensions that we experienced in 2019 have hurt everyone, but that they have hurt particularly bad, the most vulnerable. The crisis that was caused by this double blow of COVID and, and trade tensions have hit SMEs particularly hard, as, as was mentioned in the, previous, uh, in the previous conversation. A survey that we conducted here at ITC shows that very clearly. Two thirds of micro and small firms had been strongly affected by the crisis. And this is compared to about 40% of large companies. And 38% of them said that they were 
very likely to close in the next three months because of COVID-19. This was closed in, a, in June, July. We published this report in July, so it's safe to assume that these numbers have gone up. And what's worse, negative shocks to SMEs worsen social outcomes because SMEs tend to employ a large share of the most vulnerable uh, uh, sections of the workforce. So again, the same report that we did, the same survey that we did at ITC, shows that women-led firms were more negatively affected by the pandemic, with 64% of them saying that their business operations had been strongly affected. And again, this compared to 52% of men-led companies. And this already takes into account something that Chantal mentioned in, in her talking points, that women tend to be disproportionately uh, um, employed in sectors that were hard hit, such as non-essential services. So these numbers already take into account that. So even for those companies in the same sector, those led by women have been uh, hit the hardest. And similarly, 26% of youth-led enterprises reported a high likelihood of closure compared to 18% of non-youth-led businesses. So here we see COVID-19 impacting SMEs very hard, and amongst those SMEs impacting those that are led by the most vulnerable parts of our population. Thank you so much. That was really important. Now, directly a question to you, which was raised by Nazim Yavet. Why not create a 10 years tax free plan for all SMEs under 10 million turnover? What do you think? Is that a good way forward to help SMEs to get out of the crisis? Well, I don't think it is my place to say that national governments should or should not be, uh, be allowing uh, SMEs to be tax-free, although many governments around the world have simplified tax systems and lower tax rates for SMEs. Obviously, that will depend on the particular conditions of the country, so it's very hard to give a cross-cutting uh, response. However, one thing that we need to bear in mind is that many governments are now providing support to companies that have been hit by COVID-19. That money will have to be recouped somehow. So if on top of that, there is a, a tax free uh, for SMEs, then the tax rate will increase for others. So we also have to bear in mind uh, all the trade-offs that we have. Although at ITC, we're particularly focused on SMEs and we believe that any support that governments can provide to those companies is very valuable. We also need to bear in mind that there is also a price to be paid by other parts of the population that are generating employment elsewhere. That's very true. Thank you so much, Barbara. And if you could put the link to the report you just mentioned into the chat, Absolutely. because uh, we have already questions where the number can be found. Alvaro, the ILO today came out with a new updated um, COVID monitoring report. The numbers are really horrific. So what is the ILO doing to support SMEs to survive these difficult times? Over to you. Thank you, Matthias. First of all, I want to thank also the IOE for the invitation. And yes, of course, I mean, we all know that the consequences of this crisis are very, uh, are taking a huge uh, amount of jobs away from countries and are destroying companies everywhere. The question is, what can we do as the international system to support not only those companies who are struggling to survive, but also those workers who are struggling to uh, maintain their jobs or to find uh, alternatives in other sectors? The problem is that the crisis is basically affecting uh, simultaneously all countries and in some countries in like in like the ones in Central America are affecting the, the sectors that have generated more jobs over the last uh, decades. So the sectors that are being hit the most are particular sectors where women are overrepresented and that is of, of course another uh, source of concern for the ILO. But just to, to go back to you, we do and what we can do and, and try to do better. One of the things that we believe is in the need to give voice to SMEs in deciding the rules of the game, the policies, the programs, how uh, the governments are responding to the crisis. And for that, we work closely together with the IOE membership worldwide, basically to strengthen their capacity to influence policies and programs. And that is a critical, important question and function in this current context. 
how are governments deciding how to invest resources, how to tackle the crisis, what measures to take, who is going to benefit because there are not resources to, uh, to help everyone. So at the end of the day, the choice in terms of what policies are going to be targeting what sectors in terms of policy response, uh, crisis response, that is a, a highly, uh, there's a high competitive market in terms of influencing those. So making sure that SMEs are, have a voice in making those decisions and making those calls, that is critically important. And that's why we work closely with the IOE membership, basically to strengthen the capacities of employer organizations, business associations, in influencing those policies and making sure the interests of the SMEs are taken into account. That is a very important role in, that we play in the international system in collaboration with the IOE and its membership. We also try to advance the agenda of SMEs through a number of services, uh, specifically markets that need to be strengthened, for instance, how to provide services, uh, business development services, because, because it's not only credit. I mean, the liquidity uh, challenge right now is very important and, and tackling that liquidity challenge is, is what most countries and governments are doing, but it's not going to be enough. So you need to make sure that there is a number of services beyond only providing credit that are available uh, and timely available to SMEs to recover from this crisis. One of the challenges, for instance, for many companies in, in the current cost context is how to access markets. And we believe that still there are markets in developed countries which are value, which value uh, labor law compliance and, and you know, most of the, uh, the environmental standards that those consumers are requesting for uh, in, the, in their markets. And making sure that labor law compliance is a competitive advantage to companies and to uh, in value chains, that is something that we have been working with for instance, in the banana sector in Dominican Republic, a sector that is uh, 20,000 people work in that sector, uh, 1,600 companies, small producers are basically engaged in exporting to European markets and keeping those markets open and making sure that compliance with labor legislation is a competitive advantage. That is something that is critically important for the sustainability of those uh, producers in the long term. And just finally, to go quickly over things that I believe as Chantal, I'm also an optimistic. So I, I like to think that in this crisis, things can actually work in, in favor of some goals, uh, SDG goals, and how this crisis is helping those companies align themselves with those goals. For instance, tech tourism. We have, Costa Rica is a sector that is very reliable on tourism. I mean, uh, we used to have, before the crisis, uh, about 2 million people visiting this $5 million country, a $5 million people country. So one of the things that we have seen is a turn, uh, uh, a high demand for solar energy and for sources of energy that are less costly uh, as a way to tackle also uh, the challenge and to increase the resilience of these companies in front of this crisis. So there's, a, uh, there's also an increased collaboration between the worker and the employer. For instance, when it comes to health and safety, how to strengthen safety and health in the workplace, which is critically important to combat the virus, because it's not only stay at home, it's how you make also the place where you work a safe place to work. And making sure that that happens implies and involves collaboration from all three parties. It's not enough for the government to publish the protocols if they don't apply them at the workplace. And it means workers and employers working together to face this challenge and making sure that business continuity is possible through the application of these standards. Thank so you. those are just uh, uh, some of the things we are looking at uh, in Thank the current context. Thank you. Matt. Thank you so much, Alvaro. Now, I directly want to address a question to you which came up here in the chat. Whether you know any instances where governments and universities are partnering to make sure that we have data-driven decisions for the SME sector. Are you aware of any kind of these kind of partnerships between university and governments? And I will come to you, Barbara and Chantal, in a minute on this question. So, but first to you, yeah. Alvaro. Any awareness yeah. where you can speak about such a partnership? 
Yeah, we have in, in the Caribbean of Costa Rica, we're actually engaged in a process with three clusters and that's, uh, uh, we're working together with universities, governments and businesses. And this crisis actually has increased the need to register because if you want to access the benefits that are there, then you need to be registered. So registration and having allowing access to data uh, to these uh, entities in this uh, kind of uh, public private partnerships it is an example that uh, where we have actually seen that kind of uh, outcome because of the crisis. Thank you. Great. If you have any link to this partnership, you can put in the chat. That would be great. So our participants could, could directly then go to there. Barbara, any kind of partnership you want to mention here? Uh, all of these studies that I mentioned, they're actually underpinned by a survey that the ITC conducts uh, in partnership, not with universities, but with business support institutions in the countries. We have now a database of over 20,000 uh, companies and we analyze their competitiveness across these dimensions that I explained uh, in my talking points. So we do have that partnership, not necessarily with universities, although we're looking to expand towards that, but with business support institutions in the countries to collect the semi specific data. Excellent. And Chantal, any partnership you are aware of between governments and universities? Yeah, well, we we actually partner for our Empretech centers, which are provide behavioral uh, capacity for entrepreneurship in developing countries. Actually, they are in uh, more than 40 countries. Um, we actually a lot with the government, when the, the government requests us to uh, and, um, to implement an Empretech center, we have a bid of who is the best institution. In some countries, will be universities. Uh, so they literally are the host of those unprotect centers and partner with us. But we basically, uh, through the ISAR process where we do this work, uh, the private sector and the uh, NGOs and the, the academia are all at the table to be able to develop these policies. So we, and, and this project I mentioned on that we will be developing at the regional level and then uh, on new registration, data reporting and supporting um, MSMEs involve all of the stakeholders. We spoke about the support of international institutions for SMEs. We come now to the employers and business organization, which of course have a key role to support their membership. And I'm very happy to welcome here Henrik Munte from Norway and Douglas Opio from Uganda, who are very active in the international employers community. So how you, from the employer's perspective, support your SME members? Henrik, over to you for five minutes. Thank you so much, Matthias, and good afternoon, or good evening, or good morning to all of you, wherever you are. Uh, thank you. I'm very glad that I've been invited to this conference and can uh, been given the chance to talk to you. I represent NHO, which is the Confederation of Norwegian Enterprise, which is the largest and most influential business and employers organization in Norway with uh, almost 30,000 members and close to 600,000 full-time employees in their companies. 91% of our members are SMEs actually, which means that they have less than 100 employees. And my brief presentation will of course be based on the experience we in NHO have when it comes to serving our SME members so that they can Remain, remain viable and sustainable, as it's phrased in the title of my intervention. The situation and experience, however, might be quite different in other countries. In her recent State of the Union speech, the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, stated, SMEs are the motor of our economy and will be the engine of our recovery. The statement is, of course, linked to the COVID situation, but in my opinion, it's relevant also when it comes to employment and sustainability. Chantal has given us a broad picture, and now I'll be more specific what a relatively small organization in a small country can do to their members. So, and my first point is self-evident. The business organization and employers organization should treat their SMEs members with respect. It's unacceptable if part of the organization takes much more interest and take more care of larger member companies since they are the ones who pay larger membership fees. Representatives from the SMEs should have a say in all the committees, groups and boards and so on. 
on uh, that uh, are responsible for running the organization. Not least, it's important to have representatives from SME companies on the board of directors. One delicate matter is the, in most member organizations is the membership fee, how it should be calculated. We, as many other organizations, have a fee based on the number of employees, so to be more precise, the total amount of salary paid to the employees in the company. As a consequence, the smaller companies pay less than the larger ones. Most important for today's discussion is that NHO has established a forum for SMEs with representatives from SME companies in a number of sectors. This forum is served by a secretary, secretary a dedicated colleague of mine. Uh, however, she involves many of her colleagues in NHO, experts in different fields, uh, when that is appropriate. This means that the forum and its member have access to all the expertise and resources within the NHO. Although many of the topics of importance for SMEs are of interest for the entire business community, some areas are more pressing for SMEs than for other companies. Recently, our forum has concentrated on some specific topics. And Alvaro has mentioned several of these already, so I'll do this very quickly. Access to a skilled workforce, including apprenticeships and vocational training is important. Access to capital financing is also a great importance, and it has to be mentioned that part of our tax system is unfavorable for some family-owned SMEs. Fight against undeclared birth. Public procurement is of importance. It's sometimes difficult for SMEs to compete because of the requirements established by the authorities. And finally, cutting red tape and the strive for simplification of the rules and reporting requirement. Thank you. That is really important priority. Thank you so much, Henrik. These are really, mm. I think, priorities which many SMEs in the world are facing and which we have to focus on. And Douglas, I would mm. like to bring you in at this point. And when you speak about your experience in Uganda, perhaps you can directly address one question, which is how can we develop low-cost initiatives and actions so SMEs can help um, to pursue the SDGs? Perhaps you can directly also to reply to that. Douglas, over to you about your experience. Douglas, you have to unmute yourself. Still muted. Perhaps in the meantime, Douglas, um, we directly go, we come back to you once the technical problem is solved. Um, we spoke a lot about SMEs. Now it's really important to hear from SMEs. And we have two important SMEs here. One is from the fintech sector. The other one is from the energy sector. So I really would like to welcome Nasri Mood to this conversation as well as Luis Camara. Thank you so much for spending your very valuable time with us because now we want really to hear from you what are the successes you need from us? What are the um, support you need from us in, able, in, in order to be able to sustain in this difficult crisis? So perhaps Nasri, if you could start with you for five minutes, if you could give guidance, what are the challenges and how can we support you? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Matthias. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very, very uh, well. Great. Uh, all right. The emerging technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, the Internet of Things and 5G are changing our economies at warp speed and scale. Uh, I've prepared a quick deck uh, to share everybody within this uh, next three to four minutes and appreciate that the admin activate the uh, icon button for me to share my screen. Uh, now, SMEs, especially the traditional ones, need to embrace such technologies such as AI to power up uh, their operations. The digital economy is certainly a driver for innovation and competitiveness. SMEs need to leverage on AI technology to be agile in the face of disruption and to create new digitally enabled business models in the new normal. 
the unprecedented disruption by COVID-19 is accelerating the urgency for agility, adaptability, as well as transformation. We estimate that seven out of 10, or rather 70% of new value created in the economy arising from the SME side over the next decade will be based on digitally enabled platform business models. Um, may I have the uh, option to activate uh, my screen share, please? Thank you. Now, while waiting for that, uh, the SMEs are basically exposed to a wide enterprise ecosystem. It has to deal with shareholders, regulators, finances, the environment, economy, industry, employees, and so on and so forth. It's going to be a, a big responsibility for the SMEs to operate in such a vast and deep ecosystem. And do you know that on average, we make about 35,000 decisions a day, a source by psychology today. And uh, this is where it becomes very critical for uh, SMEs that are exposed to many of these issues uh, to be able to make decisions very quickly. And um, basically the problem statement is that enterprises or MSMEs lack access to affordable AI technology to cope with the volume and pace of information to help make better decisions. So we've heard of financial inclusivity, but what about technological inclusivity? the ability to access affordable and uh, uh, smart technology for them to process information. So as such, uh, this is where AI comes into the picture. Okay, And uh, the problem that we highlighted earlier is that uh, the SMEs would be able to address all these thousands of decision making to be done every day, vast information with the pace of uh, industry and economy by having a robo advisor or a robot to be able to harness and garner all the information and tell the potential issues that are likely to happen and propose some recommendations to address those issues. So this is the kind of uh, technology that is needed by the MSMEs uh, that are able to harness and go through, ingest and digest all the information and be able to predict and prescribe set of actions uh, on how to deal with their financials, how to deal with their marketing, operations, HR, and so on. So how agencies can help SMEs globally is to be able to use such technology to be handling and helping conducting health checks for up to 1 million over SMEs within four weeks and identify gaps and areas for restructuring they then will be able to handle or develop roadmaps to implement areas of intervention. Instead of doing manually, it is basically automated. Okay, and then um, uh, and be able to have measurable outcomes, connecting and guiding consultants and experienced uh, case workers to be able to help these SMEs and coaches, right? And at the end of the day, uh, the third step is basically we must be able to uh, enable the SMEs to infuse AI technology in their operations to handle HR, finance, management, operations and strategy and so on. So this becomes very critical for the SMEs to be able to have, uh, uh, to be given assistance by the uh, agencies on a wider scale. The old method of manually intervention or manually coaching SMEs are long over because uh, we felt that between 60 to 70% of SMEs are in danger of collapsing because of the effects of COVID. So at the end of the day, um, SMEs can also AI uh, can also adopt AI uh, to help them in integrated reporting, the ability to ingest and digest qualitative and quantitative information to tell a story, even though integrated reporting is largely adopted by larger corporations, but the smaller entities would be able to use AI to explain, to help them tell a story, capture reader interest and explain their business worth in terms of the six capitals of integrated reporting, such as financial, human, intellectual, natural, social and relationship, as well as manufactured capital. So my key takeaway in this is that enterprises play an important role, as we know, in any country's ecosystem. Technological inclusivity is just as important as financial inclusivity in the wake of digital disruption, in the wake of digital economy that's moving faster than ever. Agencies and policymakers play an important role to make sure they're equipped with the necessary technology. Augmented intelligence is a subset of AI, artificial intelligence, in the sense that rather than AI itself, augmented intelligence is a preferred model to ensure effective human and machine engagement. The outcome is through AI, augmented and artificial intelligence the same way, the SMEs can be assisted to help achieve the triple bottom line goals, 
align with the SDG goals as well as encourage them, enhance their integrated reporting for their key stakeholders. Thank because you. Because of that, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. That was really important. And the digitalization of SMEs is, of course, a huge, huge topic. But key for that is, of course, that you train SMEs so they can really make full use of the opportunities of AI. And there I would like to bring you in, Louis. What rule of uh, sorry? What rule is training playing actually for the development of SMEs? What kind of training does SME need actually in order to be successful in the post-corona times? Over to you, Louis. Louis, you are muted. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself, Louis. You are muted. Now you have to still unmuted. You are still muted. You have to click. There's normally a button saying share audio that you have to press. During Louis is we trying to help Louis Douglas. You are now ready to come in. You're still muted, Douglas. We can't hear you. The problems. I don't know from the technicians whether someone can help to bring Douglas and Lewis in. There seem some technical problems. Okay. Okay, Lewis left, Douglas. That's true. Carla just said it wouldn't be a virtual conference without some technical difficulties. That's very true. But I must say normally if we host our own events, we have full control of the platform. So our challenge here is when you are on a foreign platform which you don't have control over, it is even more difficult to make sure that all the speakers have the possibility to speak. Um, I'm very sorry that Douglas and Louis didn't have the chance to intervene, but we're running out of time. So I would go to our president, Eric Karazepi, to give some concluding remarks because we have to finish here at six o'clock. Errol, over to you. Errol, you are also muted. I'm so sorry for this thing. Amadou, can you make sure that people are, technicians are please unmuted? Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry for these technical problems which you're facing here. I think it was nevertheless a very rich conversation. Um, I feel like a bit in these movies where you set up with difficulties. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, Technic is against us. Um, exactly. There's a good idea from Martin. Martin suggests everyone who cannot speak because of technical problems, please give your contact details in the chat so we can share then your presentation. Uh, you can then directly share uh, your contacts with them so people can contact you. I am so sorry I cannot say about these challenges. Um, my key takeaways which we had here is A, we need more data, more data so we can better support SMEs. My second key takeaway in this conference was that we need um, help companies in better ways how to go onto the global market. And there are different initiatives to do so. Um, we understand from Alvaro, particularly his experience in the Caribbean with uh, fruits. We understood from Barbara, which has a huge, huge database actually, how to support companies. Employers organization play a huge role and Henrik has explained to us how important it is actually that SMEs are not only getting services, but they are part of the decision making being at the board of um, the employers federation and having also a say in the positioning, although they are not necessarily paying the big contributions. Um, in the fact that um, we have these challenges from your side, Barbara, Chantal, Alvaro, 
if you can speak any uh, key takeaways from your side you want to mention here i'm not sure whether you can anyway unmute yourself but we try <laughs> do you have any other key, key takeaway you want to mention here barbara I, yeah. I guess I unmuted myself. That's wonderful. I tend to agree with you, Matthias. I think at ITC, we are striving very hard to build this database on SME information. I, I agree with Chantal that this is, this is a huge uh, uh, obstacle towards implementing more targeted policies is just the lack of, of data. Uh, so I saw on the chat a lot of universities, a lot of other organizations uh, engaged in data collection. I would be very happy to have a bilateral conversation with them and see how we can further partner to coordinate our efforts as well uh, and to build an even larger database uh, that we can all have access to as this is a tremendously important public good. Thank you. Chantal, 30 seconds, you would key takeaway in case you can unmute. Yeah. As I put in the chat, if you can hear me, um, it, it, MSMEs are not small, they're huge, and we need to give them huge attention. We can't miss another crisis. We need to provide support and reporting, helping them report in the right direction, aligned with the SDG and climate change, is the way we're going to help them um, be able to have that attention. 30 seconds. Thank you. I'll just take more point I couldn't uh, before it because you cut me off from Matthias but that is that we have because of the timing Henrik exactly, sorry for that. yeah I understand that of course but what I would like to say that it's also when it comes to sustainability and CSR matters they they say the SMEs are very important and finally that we have a close cooperation with the UN Global Compact in NHO that's all on my side. Thank you so much for the initiative. Now the sound is up. Hello, you listen to me? Now we can listen to you. Over to you. You have the last word. Okay. This is my last word. Thank you. So, thank you for all. First, I would like to say that it is an honor and pleasure for me to take part in discussion today. I will try to answer these important questions within the time that I have. Based on my experience as an entrepreneur and as an employer, one of the best ways to, to enhance knowledge and skills in through training. Getting employees exposed to relevant and consistent training can help us smith improve our performance and increase results in the workplace. Reading the African context, we often face skill shortages because of several reasons. One of the most important is due to the quality of training. Therefore, when it comes to hiring too many times candidates that have the potential, unfortunately, do not always have we appreciate skills. Even for entry level jobs, sometimes, what do we do? What do we do in context where in creating of decent employment is crucial for providing sustainable income, creating a pathway out of poverty? Our educational system have their role to play but we cannot deny that we also have as private sector actor a social responsibility. This is where training comes because it represents a good opportunity for employees, especially the small and medium enterprises, to help their employees grow their knowledge and improve their job skills. Despite the cost of training, the return of investment in Degrees of for SMEs if contesting. I think that there are several reasons why it is important for our sector, I mean for small and medium enterprises to initiate training programs. Please allow me quickly for mention a few. Just I have these five points. Number one, training improves skills and knowledge. Employee training programs help improve the knowledge and skills of employees to match the value change in the industry. 
these improvements will positively affect the productivity of workers, which can increase the profit and efficiency of an organization. Some of the employees may learn through training includes work ethic, human relation, and safety. Number two, it satisfies the recommendation of performance appraisals. When an organization employs performance appraisal subject, the need for improvement on a particular subject or skill training programs can be organized for staff members to help satisfy these requirements. These requirement. Training can therefore address and identify problem area and work toward a solution. Number three, employer for higher responsibility in the future. Training programs help prepare employees who are moving into higher role and taking in more responsibility in an organization. These programs will help them learn the skills that are required for function effectively. In their new position, for example, they may be trained in global management or leadership skill or a specific software they will use in their new. Number four, show employees their value. Implementing training programs in the workplace will help employees feel like the company investing in them. Be continuing to teach your employees new skill in ability. They will not just become better workers, they will feel like more productive member of, an organi of the organization. This will improve the morale as well as their workplace capability. Number five, and finish, it tests the efficiency of the new performance management system. Employee training programs help an organization test the efficiency and effectiveness of the new performance management system, which will help HR establish clearer performance expectations. Using this system to train your employees will reinforce the necessity of meeting goals, help employees better understand what is expenses of them. Investing in employees, training and education is irrefutable for the sustainable development of SME. Training improves skill and knowledge prepare employees for high responsibility and reinforce the necessity of meeting goals. This is why our company, Kamsa Petroleum, we have something a few years ago that training will be the pillar of our transition to greener energy, not only be to be a sustainable company, but also for enabling conditions for environmental Thank sustainability. You. Excuse me, it's English. Perfect. It's much better than Thank my you. French, I can tell you, Louis, much better than my French, which is, although I live in Geneva, after Thank 10 you. years, still reduced to hello and goodbye. So thank you, Louis. And I think it was an important ah, okay. point that you raised about not only vocational training, but also just transition to make sure that employees, that the workers can make the move with the company to a greener future. So thank you for that. Errol, we have a last try. Can you unmute yourself? Not yet. So, Errol, now we can't hear you. Okay, it's not working. Thank you so much to the um, presenters and to the speakers. I'm so, so sorry for these difficulties. I'm really embarrassed, I must say personally, but that is what it is. Uh, we live with a challenge. Next time it will be at the IE platform and it will work much better. I promise you that we have done huge conference with hundreds of people and never any problem. So come to the IE um, digital conference. The next one is tomorrow on child labor with the Peace Nobel Prize winner Kalisha on how to build alliances to end and eradicate child labor. We are looking forward to seeing you there. Have a good afternoon, a good evening. Stay safe.
Thank you, Mathias, and nice meeting you all. Thank you. Great conversation. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.